Gianna, what do your socks look like? I got flowers. All right, no more socks. Let's do science. Hi, I'm Michaela. I lead the science team here at Future House. For the last 10 years, I've been really curious about trying to understand the molecular mechanisms that govern gene regulation in human cells. I'm Mike. I lead the platform team here at Future House. I started my career out with a PhD in computational material science. But for the last 10 years, I've been working on uh, machine learning and AI teams. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm co-founder and head of science at Future House. My job is to think about how each of our projects work towards automating science. So yeah, we're at Future House. And we're trying to take all the advances from AI and the resources put into AI and translate it to accelerate scientific discovery. When we co-found a future house, we noticed that a lot of the, the productivity in science had been decreasing. So there's more papers published every year, there's fewer breakthroughs, uh, and we wanted to see if AI could play a role in bringing that productivity back up. Artificial intelligence methods have gotten to the point where they can actually accelerate science. And so at future house, we're trying to build um, pieces towards something we call an AI scientist, which basically means automating the different components of science, such as searching literature, generating hypotheses, and doing analysis. In the near-term future, you know, within the next couple of years, I think most discoveries in science are gonna have an AI-driven component behind them. Maybe it's doing initial literature search, maybe it's helping with the analysis in some way, but it's gonna be ubiquitous. And it's our mission at Future House to accelerate science. And today, we're gonna be sharing some examples of how our platform can help scientists make more discoveries. Today, we're releasing Future House Platform, and it'll have four new agents on it. The first agent is called Crow. It's an agent that's sort of perfect for concise answers to literature search questions or questions that might need to use data sources like open targets. The second agent that I'll be releasing is called Falcon. This one's more of a deep search tool, so it considers more sources, and it gives you a report long form answer. The third we'll be launching is called Owl. It focuses on doing a precedent search. So if you're curious if something has ever been done in science, it's really good at having high recall and looking in the past for the nuances of what's been done. And the fourth one we're launching is called Phoenix. It's a chemistry agent, so it's a little bit more bespoken than the others. And it focuses on uh, things like synthesis tasks or cheminformatics questions that you might have. So today we're going to take a look at what these four agents are able to do. So Michaela, why don't you share with us the example? Yeah, so uh, my friend was recently complaining to me that she has PCOS and she's really struggling to find a, a good treatment that's non-hormonal. I have a background in human genetics and human gene regulation, but not in PCOS. So I thought this was a great opportunity to see if I could use our tools to come up with what a new treatment could be. So first I go to Falcon, which is our deep search agent, and I ask a general question. So provide a comprehensive explanation of PCOS, including its definition, symptoms, diagnostic criteria, and underlying causes. After Michaela submits this, you're gonna see this load for a moment, and then once the agent actually starts working on it, one of the best parts of our platform is that you can actually observe the reasoning while the agent's doing. There's these different sort of phases that the agent goes through to get its answer. If we start out here, you can see the agent gets some context about what the question is, and the first choice that it makes is to do a paper search. And you can see it created its own search uh, term here. This is all sort of automatic and determined by the agent itself. And you can see this sort of rich metadata that comes back from this search. Again, our agents are aware of uh, citation counts. They're aware of citation graphs. They're aware of um, the uh, provenance of the journals that the information comes from. So you can see like the quality of information. And that's all part of the inference process for these agents, uh, just like a scientist would do if they're reading actual journal articles. And then if we go to the next step, we can see we pulled 19 papers on that first step. The agent decides to also include information from clinical trials that all were sort of evidence-based attempts to treat polycystic ovary syndrome. And then you can see after gathering both of those sources, it's now got this gather evidence step. And in the gather evidence step, a really intensive reasoning process occurs where all the papers are split up into pieces and our agent attempts to find what the most relevant contextual evidence is for the question that the person has asked. And this sort of like information funneling is extremely powerful in our system. We've uh, done publications before that sort of benchmark it against other systems. And it's one of the most performant information extraction systems that exists in the field today. And after that evidence, the agent determined that this was sufficient in order to write report, so it actually uh, generates output. Real briefly, I wanted to just show there are these task details that kind of show like what the agent was actually doing, what that looks like. Again, this is sort of all in the spirit of transparency. You can see it considered 32 papers in total. Only 24 of those papers were determined as relevant for this particular question, and ended up referencing 20 in its final report. It's looking at each sort of piece that comes out of those works from the literature, analyzing all the different pieces and seeing in the context of this particular question, what is the most relevant sort of piece of information that would actually contribute to a useful answer? It used, you know, 62 different individual pieces of evidence. When you can also see that the enormous number of queries are run come to this answer, there was a lot of orchestration going on under the hood in order to come to an answer like this. If we go to the output of all of this literature gathering, what we can see is we get a really nice comprehensive overview of PCOS, of the causes of the disease, clinical features of the disease, the diagnostic criteria, etc. And one of the things that stand out to me here 
here is that it's strongly genetically associated. So I say, okay, let's take that one step deeper. And so I go to Crow, which is our concise search agent, and ask a more specific follow-up question. What are key genes and genetic loci that have been consistently identified in genome-wide association studies, which is a way that we can statistically link genetic variants to traits such as PCOS? And it says there are multiple genes that are statistically associated with having PCOS, which is something that would take me a long time to figure out on my own whether these genes had come up in multiple studies. But we don't know if they are functionally related in any way to the actual symptoms. What I can then do is I can go to OWL, which is our precedent search, to ask if anyone has done a CRISPR screen to functionally link these GWAS hits to hyperandrogenism in PCOS which shows me that yes, there has been a functional genomic study done that in particular links an increase in expression in a particular gene, DEN D1A, to an increase in testosterone expression in cell culture. This is interesting. So we can ask one more follow-up question. Has anyone determined why increased DEN D1A expression actually causes this increase in hyperandrogenism? And as it turns out, we don't know the answer to that yet. And so right away, in a series of four questions, I've been able to go from not really understanding anything about PCOS to finding a critical gap in the field which ordinarily would take me, you know, hours and hours of reading, talking to experts to try and figure out how to make a contribution to having some clear next experimental steps to try and figure out a new target that we could drug to potentially treat it in a non-hormonal way. If we look at this last follow-up question that Michaela ran, and specifically the output, one of the things that you'll see here is like each one of these citations themselves, it's not just a link to the article itself, but if you click it, you'll actually see the actual reasoning trace the model used in order to explain why that source was selected to be used in, in your final answer. This isn't a general summary of the article. This is a summary in the context of Michaela's specific task, Michaela's specific question. This is unique to the platform as well. This kind of reasoning is uh, often kind of implicit and it's not actually part of what you can see, but it, it ends up being really important if you're trying to understand why a model made a certain decision to include something. Um, and I think like those are real highlights of the literature search capabilities. The scale element of it is important, especially for scientists, because you know most researchers who have a, like a deep domain experience in say biology or drug design, they're not going to be engineers. So things like a scraping peepers, things like um, you know setting up distributed databases, things like rate limiting, are tasks that are out of their domain. So you know developing platform is a way for us to give access to researchers like these different tools and kind of take that infrastructure you know, out of their hands. Built this platform as a way to actually make new discoveries. This demo shows us how we can get from you know, very little knowledge of a topic all the way up to the frontier and also identify what are the gaps, right? Like uh, we found out that we don't know functionally why DEN D1A uh, is actually affecting this disease. To make a scientific discovery, we have to come up with a therapeutic, a drug that could actually maybe affect the outcome of this disease. One of the things that's really interesting about uh, LLMs is that they're really bad at chemistry. If you give them a molecule and you ask them to like, you know, how many nitrogens are in this molecule, they, they can't count them. Or you ask them to make a molecule, a lot of times what comes out is actually not a valid molecule. And so as compared with like literature search, literature search is sort of the native space of LLMs, right? Like reading and summarizing, synthesizing knowledge, that's that's their, their home turf. When it comes to chemistry, we actually have to add a lot more tools because they can't do things that are just pretty basic. Instead of calculating like, What's four times four using its weights? It can just use a calculator. Or if it wants to know, you know, what was the latest FDA approved drug on a particular disease, we can just Google that. But now how do we actually start making progress in generating a hypothesis and testing it? So the next uh, stage is using Phoenix, which is a small molecule cheminformatics agent. So I can go go to Phoenix and say, okay, propose three novel compounds that could treat a disease caused by overexpression of ND1A. In this example, um, we want to basically start you know, a drug discovery campaign. And to start drug discovery, you have to really start with a, what's called a hit, and then you sort of develop it. So you start with a molecule that maybe binds to your protein, you wanna like make it a little more soluble, you wanna make sure it's not patented, you wanna make sure it doesn't go into the liver or the kidneys, things like that. And so we have some tools for all these different steps. So in this example, we start by saying, are there known binders to that protein? So the first thing it does is it uses a tool to find known binders against this gene. And in fact, there's no known binders for this gene. This gene is actually not well studied. So I think this gives us a clue that there could be something novel here. And what we see is a few different um, small molecules that are known to bind with things that this protein interacts with. One of the things I want to do is make sure that this compound is, is novel, and that is sort of what allows you to invest the capital to continue on a drug discovery campaign. And again, this is something like LLMs don't have memorized every single patented compound, so we have to use a tool for this. And it finds out some of them are not novel, so what it tries to do is do some modifications to see like if we do some small changes to it, can we get it to a space of, of novelty? And also, is it into a space where we can actually modify the molecule? Because downstream in drug discovery might need to make it more soluble, we might find out that like the dosing is not right and we need to change it to like a pro drug or something. So a lot of these tools are basically evaluating how much of a lead that this could be. 
And so if we go sort of down to the bottom, the agent really does a good job of to look at things like, is it FDA approved already? Is it patented? What's its solubility? What are the function groups that are present in it? And then at the end, it sort of gives a report about these different candidate molecules and what they are known to bind with, why they might be relevant for uh, modulating dundee one a expression, sort of is the starting point. Uh, for going forward. So maybe from here, we could actually make these compounds. And then, you know, as the next step, we can basically test these molecules in a cell-based assay in, in our lab here. The only way to have an authentic discovery is if it's validated in the wet lab. And that will get us down this path of, you know, a hypothesis generation, observing the output, and then updating our world model of how we can actually intervene in this disease. Those scientists are going to have their own workflows. And obviously, UI is great, but it's not going to work in an automated fashion. So we give access to uh, an API interface so scientists can actually build the outputs of our tools into their own workflows. And for us, that's a really important piece of this because you can't actually scale any of this up if you don't have an API interface. Unlike a lot of other platforms and companies working in this area, we're scientists. And from that, we want to make everything open source. We want to publish what we are finding. And we want to share with the community so people can build off of this and, and not just, you know, try to get as many users as possible. So we put all that out there and we're really excited for people to use our open source methods. And we hope that people come up with better ideas because at the end of the day, we want to make discoveries and we don't want to just make the best agent. We want to really push science forward. The next stage for Future House is to sort of expand the scope and what we can do with this platform. And so Mike, what's next? I have agents now that are very good at like analyzing information in the, in the literature and generating new ideas from the literature, but not so much from raw data, especially raw data that's generated from your own experiments. So I think something to look out for the future are agents that are uh, capable of not only doing the literature search, but also capable of taking in new information or lab data and coming up with conclusions that you would normally need to do in, in an analysis step. Um, and I'm really excited about that.